Good morning, everybody. Um, so Pastor Shane is preaching all three sermons this morning, so I've been tasked with um, greeting you all and talking to you about um, your connection cards. Um, so if you grabbed a connection card on your way in, be sure to tear it off. Um, you can write your name on it um, and check if you're a member, visiting, um, a new visitor, returning visitor, whatever you are, um, and drop it in the offering basket in the last song. Um, but I want to invite you guys to stand and sing our first song with us, Death Was Arrested. My sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. She's over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. And my shame was a ransom me faithfully bore. Sold my dad and he called me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over.
surrounded by your love and your grace. And Lord, we pray that your grace and your peace surrounds us so that we live each and every moment in that love. And Lord, we pray that we take this love out into the world and 
present it to everyone that we meet so that all those who hear us, who see us, or think on us, think of only you. Thank you. 
Sing just his name. Thank you so much that all we have to do, God, is just call out to you, Jesus. You just say your name, God, and the darkness trembles, God. You make darkness flee, Lord. You protect us, Jesus, and we thank you so much for that, God. I pray that you help us, Jesus, just to call on you, God. Anytime we feel overcome by darkness or troubles, Jesus, in our life, that you would just give us peace, Lord, that you would bring in all the peace, God, that you would calm the storm and calm the rage in our lives, Jesus, and just help us to know that all that we have to do is just say your name, Jesus, and Satan flees, God. All we have to say is Jesus. Pastor Shane is still in the other service. So, if y'all want, we can sing to Jesus some more. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Cool. Okay. Please be seated. <laughs> so how many extras? Ooh, loud. How many extras did y'all have to go? Like about 30? Yeah. But that's one of the things that the contemporary service does yield is this freedom and opportunity to sort of sing choruses over and over and over and over and over. Uh, even to the point, st- uh, I have a friend of mine, I, uh, we were probably 8, 10 years old. His, his father was a music director at a different church and uh, his mother was one of the she was a Sunday school teacher, and so just by, they did a lot of teaching on Sunday night, and uh, so he was always at the church, and uh, 
<laughs> one Sunday night, uh, I think he'd had his fill of church, and he, uh, on the way home, his, his parents were talking about the service, and from the back seat, he said, uh, Jesus, 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 that's all y'all ever talk about. I want to talk about the devil sometime. And uh, just this idea of singing the chorus over and over and over, it's almost like, okay, we, we get it. So, All right, let's pray, and we'll transition into our text. Oh God, we, uh, in this time of reflection and worship where we want to, to be infused with the text in hopes that in the reading and the hearing of the gospel lesson, the scriptures, that um, your Holy Spirit weaves into this in a way that what's created inside of us uh, is uh, either the nature of Christ or, or uh, a maturation of that, a growing of that, so that when people look at us, and even when we look at ourselves, what we see is Jesus Christ living in us. And so we pray this, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Now, some of you, let me, before I read the text, I do need to, uh, some of you, I might need to introduce myself to you, because I haven't been in this service in a while. Uh, my name is Shane Green. I'm one of the ministers here. And uh, the good news is, at least for me, I've missed you guys, and that uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'll be in the, the 9 o'clock for a while, and John will be in the 8.30 service. Uh, we take turns preaching uh, for different periods of times in the 8.30 and the 9 o'clock service, if you're new to St. Paul, and we normally run about six to eight weeks. Uh, because of our building program and some of the different developments that were taking place inside of our worship center, uh, John was in for an extended stay here, and so we're, we're about to swap. And uh, so you'll s see my face for a while, and then when John comes back in, I'll have to introduce himself. So. All right, so let's look at the text. The text today is in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, verses 17 through 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all evil. Uh, some people eager for money have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, uh, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, uh, but put their hope in God, who richly provides for us everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is, that is truly life. In a uh, different church that I was serving years ago, but in a, a service similar to this, um, on, on a day that, for, like Consecration Sunday, uh, when the service was over, this was at an 11 o'clock service, so it was when the service was over, I was outside of the, of the church and was shaking hands with and greeting different people, and there was one person on, on their way out asked me this question, said, which one causes more anxiety? Not having enough to meet the basic needs of life or having more than enough so that those needs are met but now you have to deal with the excess and, and I've, I can still close my eyes and see the gentleman coming and, and, and asking the question and obviously the easy answer to that is, is not having enough um, if you think about it in terms of needs basic needs uh, for life um, there, there are needs that have to take place. I mean, some of you are probably thinking of the guy by the name of Abraham Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, if, you, if you know anything about psychology and, and maybe some of the heavyweights in psychology in the, in the last century, the 1900s, you know, Maslow was a part of that. Uh, he lived early 1900s, 1908 to, to 1970. And what, what made him famous was that he broke away from some of the schools that were going on at that particular time. There was this whole school around this idea of psychoanalysis, which is that the subconscious rules your decisions and things that are kind of floating around in, in the back part of the mind, and, and that sort of dictates a person's behavior. And then there was another dominant school that we would call uh, behaviorist or behaviorism, and that's the idea that your environment dictates what a person does or human behavior. And, but what Maslow did 
that sort of that I think is interesting is that he believed that the largest influence on a person or maybe what controls a person uh, is their values and they make their choices out of their values. And so he, he derived this whole order of, of choice or this whole order of what we know as, as needs. And you probably have seen something similar to this. This is actually Maslow's hierarchy of choices or hierarchy of needs. And, and the idea for him, and I think there's some truth to this, is that a, a person will first spend their time and energy to meet those physiological needs in their life. Needs like food, uh, needs like, like uh, food, drink, those things that they have to have to sustain life. And so they will seek and, and meet those needs first. And then upon meeting those needs, then they'll move on to maybe a, a higher version of need or, or just a step up. And, and that are needs around safety, like shelter, around protection, and then once those needs are met, then they start thinking about it in a, in a communal aspect, the, the relational needs of a person where they'll seek to be loved, they'll seek to be belonging inside of a community, and, and then upon meeting those needs, the needs then become more interpersonal, where they think about who they are, their esteem, things like that, with the goal of being this sense of awareness. Now, he used this word self-actualization, and I, some people like that term, some, some don't, that's okay. But I think there's some truth in the what he, what, at least some of his work, that a person will spend their time and energy around different levels of needs. And then upon those needs being met, then they'll progress or move to whatever the next level needs, eventually getting to a place where they are, have some awareness of who they are and the world around them and, and sort of keeping all that in connection. He also said something else that is, is also uh, important for us. He said that once you have this sense of awareness, you will actually, you're willing to sacrifice a lower need for a period of time to maintain or to grow that level of awareness. Now, in the church, we're, we're familiar with this. We don't use that terminology, but think about the whole concept of fasting. What do you do when you fast? Now, you give up something, right? Normally, you give up something that's basic or core, maybe food, maybe water, things like that. And you do that for a period of time, which is in the red, that lower level of need, in order for some higher level of need, maybe in the green or maybe in the blue. And you'll do that for a period of time. Solitude, the discipline of solitude. That's where you remove yourself from a community for a period of time so that then you could be by yourself. Again, maybe in the orange, I mean, or, or the, the yellow, in order for something higher. And so we do this inside the church where we're willing to forego a lower need for a period of time for something greater. Now, what he said is also true is that if you go for an extended period of time with, with not trying to meet that lower need, eventually you will revert back. Could you imagine what it would be like if you were to fast for 45 days? Now, in the 830 service where I just came from, I heard stomachs growling. So I don't know if you're hungry or not. Can you imagine going without food for 45 days? It doesn't matter what level of awareness you are seeking. After about, not even 45 days, probably after about two weeks or so, you're going to start making decisions to eat or making de decisions to drink water or something because your body will crave that those physiological needs will crave those types of things if you remove yourself from a community monastics all right you might have heard of those those are people that left community and people and and trekked out into the desert to where they would be by themselves what they discovered is that in the beginning that was fantastic over long periods of times it was destructive because there's something core inside of us that wants to be in relationship. And so this idea that we will meet, you have to meet certain needs that are lower before someone will seek after a higher need, that's true. And the idea that you, if you forego a lower need for a period of time, eventually you will revert back. One of the reasons why St. Paul... Uh, is involved in all the parachurch ministries in our community that are tied to poverty is because of something like this. We're, we're involved with things like, some of you are involved with ministries like Safe House, Rose Hill. Some of you are involved with Wint Neighborhood Network, involved with Mercy Med. You probably have heard of that one. Valley Rescue, uh, things of that nature. They, 
those whole ministries inside this community are designed to help solve and meet the needs on a communal level, those basic physiological needs. We don't want people to be hungry. We don't want people to be thirsty. We want people to have at least some level to care or to shelter. And so a large portion of what St. Paul does every year with our hands and our feet, with, with our energy and our time, and also with our money, goes straight out to help those people, those ministries. Because we know that if a person is hungry, it doesn't matter how often you tell them about Jesus, they want to eat. And so we need to solve those needs first. And then we'll work on community. And then we'll work on who they are so that they can, they can understand that once they're, they're, those needs are, are met. And so we're involved with that. When, when I was in seminary, um, um, one of the classes that I took was this class called Poverty in the Gospel. And it was really d d designed around three different tiers of study. The first tier... We looked at all the sayings, and we started with the Gospels, and then we ventured out into the, the New Testament, the Old Testament, all the times that Jesus talked about levels of poverty and what to do and what not to do and things like that. And so the first third of the class was all exegesis, where we're studying the Bible and pulling out of the Bible what the Bible says. The, the next period of the class is we, we moved, we took that information, and we also looked at the history of the church and all the different writings and teachings about the history of the church, and somewhere on a file, I still got all of that, that biblical work, and in my libraries, all those books and, and articles that I had to read. But there was a part that I, but those are just stored someplace. You know what I remember most about that class? It's the last part of the grade. And that was more experiential. Every person that took this class had to go spend about 18 hours in a homeless shelter. Now, I don't mean going and serving. You had to go and pretend you were a resident. Now, I know that's a little bit deceptive and what have you. And uh, I had the good fortune. We were living in Lexington, Kentucky. I had the good fortune on my night that it snowed for six inches. Now, this is a southern boy. I've always lived in Columbus, moved to Kentucky, and it snows like crazy up in Kentucky. And so the night, we, me, a buddy of mine, his name is Leslie. He's pastoring. He's a senior minister in Oklahoma. We parked about a mile down the road because guess what? If you're homeless, you don't drive a car to the homeless shelter. So we had to park about a mile down the road and trek uh, in, in, into the homeless shelter. And, and, and not knowing much about homeless shelters, when we arrived, uh, it was fairly late. So all the good mattresses were already given out. And I don't mean a mattress that had a cot and then a fitted sheet and then a sheet and then maybe a blanket or a quilt. No, it was just a bare mattress that someone would sleep in every night. The last two mattresses that we received were the ones that nobody wanted. I can, I mean, I can still smell that. Let me tell you, it was strong. And not only that, the places where you could put your mattress, mattresses, uh, th those were already taken to sleep. And so the only two places that were left were right across from the men's restroom. And so for 12 hours... I watched people, that was the night, 12 hours, watched people go in and out of the bathroom. First time for a long period of time in my life I ever saw someone carry everything they own in their hands. The fortunate ones were the ones that had a one-by-two locker. I mean, you couldn't sleep. And so all night long I watched people go in and out of the bathroom. Exposed to a whole different level of society that I've only read about. I can promise you this. Some needs have to be met before other needs can be. And so part of what we do and part of consecration, there's a part of consecration that's practical. It helps our ministries plan. Some of it has to do with finances, some have to do with people and where people will serve. But we're engaged in our community where we want to meet different levels of needs so that then people can pursue something more. And so we ask you to commit to that. We ask you to give your money. We ask you to give your time. 
We ask you to give your skill set, your intellect, your, your hands and your feet. And that's not, that's not anything we apologize about, about. We believe that we are called, used by God, to help meet needs in community. Some of them are basic. Physiological. They involve shelter, food. They involve community, belonging. And so we want to do that. Now I also want to talk a little bit about, and this is what I really want you to hear today, because as much as what you've heard so far, if I had to guess, that's not anybody's problem in here. I don't think anybody in here is going to leave this place and wonder about where they're going to go, where they're going to sleep, what they're going to eat, or what they're going to drink. See, for us, the struggle in our life is not do we have enough for basic needs. The struggle for us is what happens when the pendulum moves to the other side of the equation. And what do we do with excess? And here's where the text can be so helpful. To see our struggle is what to do with the excess. And Paul, 2,000 years ago, had some very insightful words that are important for all of us in this worship center this morning. And the first thing that Paul talked about, he said, uh, we need to recognize that there really is a temptation that comes with excess. Now, inside the scripture lesson, he talks about desire inside of a person uh, and how, again, values determine actions. And so there's desires that we have whenever there's freedom, as wonderful as freedom is. And excess is freedom. Now, you need to also hear, he, he doesn't fault this. So don't leave here thinking, oh my word, you know, he, he's not against excess. Just says you have to recognize that there's temptation with it. That with that can come certain desires. I, I, some of you, I guarantee every preacher in St. Paul's history has mentioned this, and so I don't want to be any different than every preacher before me. And, and they've talked about, you probably have heard this, John D. Rockefeller. Back in his day, uh, the richest man in the world, he was interviewed by a guy for an article. And, and I don't know if he ever regretted saying this. There's part of me that says he had to regret this. They asked him one time, they said, how much is enough? Now, he's the richest man in the world. How much is enough? You know what his answer was? Just a little bit more. And that can happen. Temptation that starts to germinate to where we think about excess and we get consumed more with excess than we do with, with just meeting needs. And, and then, then we end up making decisions where we hurt ourselves. Maybe where we hurt people, sacrifice people, sacrifice our health, sacrifice our morality, either to maintain or to grow excess. And here's the sad thing. This is not new. You don't need me to, to, to tell you this. You probably know someone who's done that. It's not something that just plagues our society. It's something that can plague human nature. So you have people that make decisions and decisions they often regret. All because it has to do with increasing excess. You know what I see in my profession? When they get near the end, They'll always say, I'm not sure it was worth it. And I think they're right. And so Paul says, you need to recognize there's, a, there's some level of temptation when it comes to excess. He said, so what you need to do is develop contentment. A different version of simplicity. Living within your means is a willful choice. 
And it doesn't matter if you make $5 or $500,000. Still a means. And living within is a willful choice that one makes. Where you're willing to live with restraints. To use a word inside the church, discipline. When we talk about consecration, often people want to reduce that to a financial picture or an issue. It never is. And it never will be. In the end, it's a heart issue. How do you want to live? What do you want to be? There are two lessons that we struggle to learn even from childhood. Now, probably not for any of the children inside the 9 o'clock service here. Let me give you that disclaimer. Uh, it's for the 11 o'clockers. You know, so y'all, y'all just, you know, um, let's go down and we'll go to the nursery and look at the 11 o'clock children. You'll see these two lessons. The first one is this. You ever seen a child who maybe has a thousand toys around him or her? Do you know what toy they want? It's not one of these. It's the one toy that someone else has. Who taught my children that lesson? And yet it's true. And sometimes as an adult, we never learn past this. The second lesson is, how many times have you driven to a place like Goodwill or Salvation Army to give away something that your child has slept with, ate with, held for a period of time? but eventually outgrew. Do you know why? Because contentment is never found with a thing, an object. And yet we still wonder with that. Just go observe human nature. You'll see it. And so learning to live with restraints, learning to live with discipline, is, is to, develop, to develop contentment requires a continual effort of purposeful living over time. And then the last one is this. Because there is a temptation and it can be like a trap, and because the remedy is to develop a level of contentment to some level of, 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 of a more simpli- simplistic lifestyle, at some point in time, we have to learn generosity. It's not a maybe. We have to learn this. To learn to live, to, to uh, learning to be generous with your time with your hands, with your money, it untangles us from the temptation of more and the temptation of pride. That's verse 17 through 19 in the text, if you want to look at it. And let me tell you what I've witnessed. This is the most illogical thing in life. People who understand this and seek to live this way, you know what they discovered? There actually can be more joy in this way of giving of themselves and helping other people than even receiving. That doesn't make any sense in the world if you think about it. And yet what they understand is that there's really a cycle in life that has to do with receiving and giving and receiving and giving. And Now if you want to use different language, blessed to be a blessing. I don't, I don't care what terms you put on it. It's the same concept. But there's something to this rhythm of life that teaches us to live differently so that these trappings that exist out, outside that can be, we're able to keep at bay. And there's a level of contentment and joy from, from living this on a personal level and then from living like this because you're able to help someone else. I cannot explain how that happens. i just tell you that it's true. 
And so there's something to this idea of giving and receiving as a way of life. John Wesley said it this way, he's the founder of Methodism, said that you earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. All three have to be held together. But it's the same concept. I don't think our issue are basic needs. I think our issue is what happens when we move over to the other side and what to do with the excess. I think Paul is right. You have to be aware. There comes a temptation with it. And so to keep that at bay, you have to work on contentment. It is not found in a thing. And so one of the ways you can do that is be generous. Now, in the other services, we've been looking at uh, a number of different things from uh, what we call taking a break from. And we've, in the beginning, and if you're interested in this, I'm, you can go to our website, look at these old sermons. It, it's a, a sense of, of false contentment and connection through electronic devices. And so take a break from those for a period of time and spend time with, with people. Uh, we looked at our calendar and how we overfunction and overschedule, thinking that's going to bring meaning to us. And so the idea is to pull back from that and then to focus on things like Sabbath and, and, and things like rhythm of our life. Uh, we, we looked all Saints Day at the, the importance of a minute, of a day. I actually prayed with someone before our 8.30 service about their life. I, they, they're, they're longing for another minute. They probably will not get it. They know the value of it now. One of them has to do with what we do with excess. You can take a break from it. Develop contentment. Work on it. Begin levels of generosity with your time, with your resources. Now, the way we do that here at St. Paul, if you're new to St. Paul on our Consecration Sunday, is we have a period of just reflection, silent prayer, and we're going to do that. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And then uh, what we'll do is there actually have, hopefully, information that's uh, either mailed to you or you might have picked one up on the way into the service. It's a connection card that may be ways that you can serve. Uh, that just helps us plan for next year. There's information that's tied to our budget for 2020, uh, yep, 2020, and uh, that has to do with people, ministry heads, finance committee on, on, on design, and we want to, the goal at St. Paul budget-wise is always to live one step beyond what is comfortable. We don't want to go too far out where we put ourselves in jeopardy, but we don't want to leave things on the table, and so when you make financial commitments, at least what your intentions are and what your goals are, that just helps us when it comes to planning. Some of you have already responded Many of you do this electronically. Some of, some of you, uh, once upon receiving that information, went ahead and sent it back in. You may have emailed our, our financial area, or we'll be doing that between now and the end of the year. All, all those are appropriate, okay? But if you have it ready, at the end of the service, before you leave, if you would just uh, drop it in some baskets that will be here. <clears throat> Tim Farmer, uh, who will be happy. Oh, they are here. Where are they? Oh, the bags. Okay, thank you. All right, so see what happens when you're out of the service for a while? You forget what goes on, right? So, uh, but in our bags, you can just drop those commitments in there, and they'll go to the appropriate areas. But I do want to invite you at this time to bow your heads with me, and we'll go through a time of, of silent reflection and prayer. And then it's going to be a prayer that we're going to pray together that's going to be on the screen, but I'll direct you. Let's pray. Oh God, as a church, we want to live one step beyond what is comfortable. And, and in doing that, with the friction that exists there, we, we learn things about ourselves and uh, about, about our life and about the world that is around us. And so in the process of where we plan uh, for next year, either as a, a community of faith here, as a body of believers here at St. Paul, we pray this, but also as individuals. We want to pray that uh, 
in, in developing discipline, contentment, generosity, that you would use them in a way to, that would help us to grow in our faith. In the end, oh God, what we always want is for people, when they look at us, to see the nature of Christ. And then that would be inviting in, that we would be used by your Holy Spirit so that, uh, that, that lives are changed, families are changed, people are changed. And if that, that involves us meeting core needs inside of our community, and our neighbors and those that are around us that use us for that endeavor, oh God, we pray. And, and use us in a mighty way. We want to be a part of that, that style of life and, and, and that level of ministry. At the same time, God, if that involves us uh, just on our sake, to, to grow in ways, maybe to live and to maybe to embrace things that we've never even believed that were possible. Maybe to, to give uh, and to serve in a ministry. Regardless if we feel qualified or, or equipped, just this heart that wants to be a part of that. And maybe maybe to, to give financially for the first time to something. Lord, it, it, we know that in order for something to take place outside of us, it first has to take place inside of us. And so we yield our hearts this morning. And as an act of, of unity and, and one voice, we want to pray this prayer that's on our screen. And pray with me. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thy wilt. Rank me with whom thy wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing. of 
the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. Oh God, as we go forth from this place, we want to be used by you. So take us under the direction of, the Holy, of your Holy Spirit, oh God. Use us for your kingdom, we pray, and we pray this in your name. Amen. You are dismissed. Till the end